Thank you very much. It's great to be back in Bern, um, and it's uh, great to be at a session where uh, my partner and teacher of 20 years, Mike Millis, is being honored. And um, so I'm going to present uh, a presentation. The primary investigator was Edward Novice, who is uh, 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 the primary investigator, one of my, our partners. In addition, uh, Bang Yen and Travis Matheny are our partners as well, uh, and they're present here today. Um, Atta Kyopra was the uh, engineer, and Dan Morano was the, uh, the research uh, fellow. So, um, so what do we know about the proximal femoral physio stability? Um, I don't. Does and why does skiffia occur? Why does impingement occur? They may be uh, a, a same problem in a, in a different part of the spectrum, and we're trying to understand that uh, better. So we know that mechanically in slips, often you have retroversion. There are obviously biological factors and uh, mechanical factors such as high BMI that may cause the slip. And we heard from Klaus that the impingement uh, is probably a distinct entity where the body is adapting to try, uh, try to stabilize the physis by uh, additional cupping. Uh, so it may be a, a physio st uh, stability problem as well. So can we develop a common mechanical uh, paradigm where we could understand both uh, uh, phenomenon um, but in a diff to be a different part of the same spectrum? So this is uh, just an animation. So there is a structure to the physis. So there's a, 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 um, a tibial epiphyseal tubercle that's located in the posterior superior part of the uh, hip. It's very consistently seen and it actually stabilizes the uh, the physis in early part of the of, of uh, growth. Uh, in addition, you, you heard about um, epiphyseal extension or physial cupping, which occurs later on in growth, and that may confer additional stability um, to the physis. So in order to understand this phenomenon better, we took a group of patients that had CT scans for, to look for appendicitis. So these were uh, patients without hip symptoms, uh, presumably normal hips. And we use that uh, to understand the structure of the physis as the hip grows. So it's a, cro it's a, it's a, co a cross-sectional cord study. So we segmented CT to look at the, the physis structure by segmenting the epiphysis and the proximal femur. And using this data, we were able to localize the epiphyseal tubercle in terms of location, as well as the size of the tubercle and the size of the cupping over time. And this has been published in the past. So what we found is that early on, so around age eight, the tubercle is quite large, relatively speaking, and the cupping is small. And then as the hip matures, the, the cupping phenomenon becomes larger, and the tubercle becomes relatively smaller. So if you were to summarize that data, uh, you can see the uh, early on in life, the relative size of the tubercle uh, is large compared to the cupping, and then that relationship changes over time. Now, in order to use this data and understand what, what's happening mechanically inside the physis, what we did was we um, took the same cord but uh, separated it into in different uh, quartiles based on the size of the tubercle. So the minimum would be a large tubercle relative to the cupping, and then uh, the opposite would be in the maximum quartile. And we took that um, CT scan data and did finite element analysis and ap applied physiological loads that were measured using instrumented uh, total hip prosthesis. So what we found is that the stress distribution early on is concentrated around the tubercle. And over time, the, the, the stress concentration shifts away from the tubercle to the, to the cup. And then finally, at near maturity, where the cupping phenomenon is quite large, most of the stress around the physis is borne by the, uh, by the, uh, uh, the epiphysis extension. So if you were to look at this um, over, uh, in general, so early on, the most of the stress concentration or stability of the physis is borne by the tubercle. And then uh, later on, in, in, towards end of maturity, it's mostly in the peripheral extension or the, or the cupping. And interestingly, 
most of the slips occur in this age group where you have this transition from the tubercle to the cup and perhaps uh, the slip occurs because the uh, epiphyseal tubercle may be insufficient or there may be too much mechanical load due to the retroversion or the obesity. So that's, that's the hypothesis. So if you were to summarize, um, the, both FAI perhaps may be a, a response to the mechanical overload, a normal response by in, enlarging the, the cupping phenomenon, and the skiffy may be the other end of the spectrum, uh, which occurs early on in, develop, in, in adolescence, and may be due to insufficient tubercle size or, or, or mechanical overload due to the obesity. Now, we wanted to understand um, this hypothesis. Is it useful clinically? And so we want to know, can we understand what's happening around the tubercle and use that to detect early slip uh, occurrence? So what we did was we have a cohort of patients that had an MRI to look for a pre-slip, um, and which were also followed over time to see if they truly had a slip or not. So obviously, uh, the, the patients that had a slip underwent inside the pinning, and then the patients that were observed where there was no MRI evidence of, of a slip uh, eventually had their symptoms resolved. So we used this cohort to look at the diagnostic accuracy of the tubercle lysis seen on X-ray compared to the gold standard seen on MR. So just to illustrate, this is a 12-year-old boy, and the tubercle is, uh, you have to get used to looking for it, but it's always localized in the posterior part of the, of the uh, physis. On the MR, there's no evidence of edema around the uh, tubercle, and this patient had uh, symptoms resolved and, and obviously did not require treatment. And this is a, another case of a 13-year-old boy. Perhaps you could say that there's some physio widening. Um, there's some lysis around the tubercle, which is clearly seen on the MR, and this patient requires surgical treatment. Turns on the data, the inter- and intra-radar reliability, both for the MR and the radiographic findings of osteolysis around the tubercle were highly reliable. And in terms of diagnostic accuracy, it was actually quite accurate in terms of predicting on X-ray what you would see on MR in terms of, uh, of a pre-slip. And finally, uh, most importantly, we want to know if this uh, isolysis around the tubercle could be useful in terms of predicting uh, a contralateral slip. As you know, in North America, we do not routinely slip, uh, pin the contralateral side, uh, unlike in Europe. So we again look, looked at a cohort of patients that had a unilateral slip, but did not have insight depending on the contralateral side, which were all followed to either uh, surgery or maturity. And we compared the findings of a tubercle osteolysis to other radiographic features of a slip. And what we found, again, is that the tubercle osteolysis is quite uh, sensitive and specific for a pre-slip. And this is just an illustration of a patient that uh, had no pain, but eventually developed pain. And even early on, you could see some evidence of osteolysis around the tubercle. And we find that this finding is actually quite an early finding compared to other radiographic findings of a pre-slip. And again, illustrating a patient that had, um, you could see the osteolysis even before uh, a pa uh, symptoms. And perhaps in the future, you could use this feature to decide whether or not a patient would require a contralateral pinning. Um, so in summary, uh, physio stability shifts from the tubercle uh, in early adolescence to the peripheral cupping in age uh, later on in adolescence. Um, the perhaps the diminished size of the tubercle is related to the development of a slip, and, um, and uh, I, we feel like the peritubercle osteolysis sign on x-ray is a useful marker of, of a pre-slip in patients with uh, skipping. Thank you very much.